All right, last lesson of this unit. Uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about population growth and two different patterns of growth, both of which will be represented by a graph. Uh, and I'll just let you know, I anticipate that with great probability, a graph will be part of a question regarding this on, well, on my test, I know for sure, because I made it, uh, but I would anticipate that on your diploma exam as well, that there would be a graph somewhere that you would have to interpret. So we're going to look at two basic descriptions of population growth. The first one is called biotic potential. And it's represented by the letter R. So that R is not a typo or a mistake or some weird thing that I just typed. That is actually what we're referring to it as. Now, I know somebody can tell me what the word biotic, biotic means. Yes, living. And anyone want to tell me what the word potential means? Like, you have potential. I'm sure a teacher has said that to you at some point in your life. What does it mean? What would it mean if I said, Maria, you have potential? You're able to do it, exactly that. So, biotic potential is then your ability to live, your ability to have life. So, biotic potential is the maximum uh, per capita growth rate, which is CGR. That's the abbreviation that's used on your diploma, and I'd like to practice it. So that is growth rate. It's not how many members there are in your population. It is the growth rate. How many new members are being added based on the original size of the population? If, and that's a big if, conditions are optimal, oops, I don't know what word that was going to be, and resources are unlimited. So biotic potential, R, is the maximum per capita growth rate if conditions are optimal and resources are unlimited. Does resources have two S's in English, or is that in French? Am I mixing it up? Oh, I do that all the time. I was taking this, uh, one of those tests on Facebook where it's common grammar mistakes, and I don't make a lot of them, but there's a few words that are spelt differently in English and in French, like the word independent. Uh, one of them is an A, the other one is an E, and I can never remember which one, but that's another word where I make mistakes because I'm not sure which language I'm speaking, or my brain isn't sure. Uh, anyways, there are four things that we could use to determine an organism's biotic potential. These four things are the number of descendants per cycle. Now, when I say per cycle, we could probably use the word per generation there. But if we want to know the maximum per capita growth rate, one of the things we should measure is how many descendants are produced in each cycle. Are there, say, 500 because you're a fish and you just laid 500 eggs? Or are there one because you're a human and you had just one baby at a time? Uh, the second thing is the number who survive to reproduce. So we could take a look at that, and that could help us determine what an organism's or what a population's biotic potential is. Obviously, if more organisms survive and reproduce, we can have more descendants per cycle. So those first two are intrinsically linked together. The third thing that we could take a look at is age of sexual maturity. Now, when we do some examples after, I'll give you some real numbers. 
Uh, but we are talking here, is it like days or weeks or are we talking years? Some organisms would be able to reproduce hours after being born, like an insect. Some organisms, it would take years after being born to be able to reproduce. Uh, and the last one we could take a look at is longevity. Generally, if organisms are going to live longer, we don't need to have a population that is growing as fast because the organisms that were born are going to continue surviving. So, if an organism is meeting its biotic potential, meaning it has its maximum per capita growth rate because conditions are optimal and resources are unlimited, we will see exponential growth. Exponential is a math word. Does anybody know when you would say exponential in math? I'm pretty sure this is what like an x squared graph looks like. I'm not a mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that's when you use the word exponential. Uh, in exponential growth, it is a J-shaped curve. Now, newer diploma style questions are supposed to use the word exponential. But if you were looking at questions that came off of old diplomas, they very regularly called this a J-shaped curve instead of exponential. I'm telling you both so that you are never left without a good explanation. Uh, so it's called a J-shaped curve because it looks like the letter J. If we were to draw a graph with the number of organisms uh, on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, a uh, population that is at its biotic potential would have a J-shaped curve. It would start off slow and become almost essentially vertical. This means that the number of organisms is increasing a lot. So as time goes by, in each time interval, many new organisms are joining the population. Now, can anyone think of a type of organism that would have this type of growth, where it does not take very long, and all of a sudden the population is huge? It's actually a really good time of year for us to be discussing this. Yes. Mosquitoes would be my number one example. Mosquitoes are probably going to start very soon experiencing exponential growth. It has been winter, and conditions have not been optimal, and resources have not been unlimited, but that is about to change for them. The temperature is increasing. There will be humidity from rain that I assume will one day fall because I fertilized my yard, so it needs to. Uh, but mosquitoes would be something that show exponential growth. The other thing that I'd like to mention, since mosquitoes was the first example, is that this is very typically a seasonal thing. If you can think of an organism that only grows or reproduces in one part of the year, they very probably have exponential growth. Now I'm talking about organisms that are not alive or are not around for part of the year. I'm not talking about like a bear that hibernates for the winter. He's still there. I'm talking about organisms that are alive in the spring and summer and then die in the fall and winter. Some other really good examples of this would be plants. So if you think about your grass, your grass was probably dead over the winter. It is gone. It is not there. Weeds, dandelions, that would be another really good example. They are about to experience exponential growth. And if you don't think that's true, go to the park in Cimarron behind St. Mary's in about three weeks and look. Right now there are very few and there will be one trillion of them very quickly because they reproduce basically out of control. The key thing here is that as a general rule, small organisms are the ones that experience exponential growth. So it's not a perfect rule, but it's a good generali generalization to make. If something is small, it could very possibly experience exponential growth. Now that's if we're seeing biotic potential, where we have the maximum per capita growth rate, 
But that cannot last forever. At a certain point, the environment is going to catch up with the organism, and that's when we get to the carrying capacity, which is represented by the letter K. I sure wish it was a C, since the word carrying and the word capacity start with C. But C and K make the same sound, so hopefully that is a nice association you can make. The carrying capacity K is the maximum population size. So now we're not talking about how fast it's growing. We're talking about how big the population can get at its maximum. Normally, we would talk about something called stable equilibrium. When we get to the point where the population is as large as it can possibly get, we will not generally see the exact same number from year to year. What we will typically see is if this is the maximum size of the population, the population will waver around this maximum number. It'll go a little bit higher, a little bit lower, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. So when you can see that a population is not really changing, maybe it's getting a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, that is where we've reached stable equilibrium. And the reason that we would hit the maximum population size uh, and have stable equilibrium is because the environment cannot support more. So when we were talking about biotic potential, the environment had unlimited resources, but we have reached the limit. The environment cannot support more organisms. So even if the population increases a bit, it'll decrease right away because there's not enough resources to support any more organisms. So instead of a J-shaped curve, we would see a logistic growth pattern. Have you guys done logs in math? I think some of you would have and some of you wouldn't, depending on if you took math 20 or 30 already. Uh, does anyone know what a log is in math? So log is like a power of 10 calculation, where 10 is the base. If you've ever calculated the pH of something, you have done a log calculation. So anyone who's taken chem, that would apply to you. Anyways, you don't have to mathematically explain this. You have to recognize that it's in the shape of an S. Now, it's not a perfect S, but if you take a look at the graph down here, it kind of looks like the letter S. Now, my graph... Uh, it's titled sigmoid growth because sigmoid is the shape of that graph. Uh, according to the biology diploma exam bulletin, logistic is the word that they are going to use. So that is the word that I'm telling you. But in older questions, you will very probably see S-shaped curve instead of the word logistic. Now there are three phases, one, two, three. Phase one is the latent phase, and you'll see most growth curves start with sort of a slow, maybe sloping uh, pattern. Part two of this graph, just like the first one that we saw, is your exponential growth. And then finally, part three, where it starts to level off uh, and the population is not growing as much. That is what we call the stationary phase. So basically we're saying when a population starts out, it takes a little while for it to get going. Then there could be rapid growth, but eventually we will hit this stationary phase where the population is not growing very much. Now this part of the graph here, once we've got to this third section, this is where we would call this the carrying capacity. That flat part of the graph is the carrying capacity. And there are two types of factors that will affect where the carrying capacity is. Density dependent and density independent factors. 
Now, density dependent factors, I would call these generally biotic factors. And density independent, I would call abiotic. So there are some reasons that a population will, s will slow down in terms of growth, or perhaps the population will hit its stable equilibrium. Density dependent factors are determined by how many members there already are in the population. So if there are already a lot of members of the population, something like predators could be a density dependent factor. If there are tons of members of your population, uh, it would be fairly easy for a predator to catch one of you because there are so many of you around, you probably occupy a large space. Another density dependent factor would definitely be competition. Any type of intra-specific competition, it could even be inter-specific competition, but usually we're focusing on the population themselves. But if you're competing for resources or mates, then you might not be able to survive and reproduce, so you'll help slow the growth of your population. Abiotic or density independent factors would be things like a flood or a fire. Things that will affect the size of a population without necessarily depending on how many there were to begin with. So I like to say here, if you can think of anything that would cause the bottleneck effect, it would be a density independent factor limiting population growth. And then together, we would call these two types of factors, the density dependent and the density independent ones, environmental resistance. So your environmental uh, resistance is the combined effect to limit population size. So basically, anything from the environment, living or non-living, that will limit population size is part of environmental resistance. Now, these are the descriptions. We need to know which type of organisms fit in each of these categories. So we're going to make a little list here of what an R strategist and a K strategist would look like. So what types of animals would fit into those categories. So R strategists, as a general rule, like we saw, have some characteristics. We'll make a list of characteristics and then we'll see if we can come up with some organisms that would fit the bill. Early reproduction is one. Organisms that are able to reproduce soon after being born are usually R strategists. R strategists have many descendants. And by many, I mean like at least double digit numbers. So I'm going to say it's got to be more than 10. If it's less than 10, we could call that a small number. Usually, in a diploma style question, the number will be big enough that you don't even have to question, is that a big number or is that a small number? Uh, for early reproduction, we are talking about days, weeks, months even. So we are talking about something that is not even a year. If they can reproduce without even being a year old, that is early reproduction. The next one is little or no parental care. So if the organism is on its own, if it is alone, if it has to fend for itself, uh, learn how to defend itself, learn how to feed itself without the care of one of the parents, 
then we would call that little or no parental care. Uh, and then the last one that is very typical uh, is that they have, maybe if I could write English words here, exponential growth followed by mass death. So that is a fancy way of saying they grow a bunch in the spring and then at the end of the summer they all die off again. So we already had mosquitoes and some plants as an example. Uh, does any, could anyone think of something else that would fit this bill? that has lots of descendants, the parents don't really care for the young, they can reproduce soon, maybe they grow a bit and then they all die off. I will give you one, a really good example, example my gosh, is bacteria. Bacteria or generally any type of microorganism will usually fit this bill. Bacteria can reproduce quickly, like it will take them minutes to reproduce. Uh, there is no parental care whatsoever. Uh, they have exponential growth uh, and then very frequently mass death because they will run out of resources to support their population. So any type of bacteria or microorganism in general would be an R strategists. Uh, we already said mosquitoes, but let's just say insects as a general rule. Most insects are dependent upon the season. Uh, there are more of them when it is warm outside and when it starts to cool off, they all die off. Small animals. So I'm going to put here some fish. Not all fish fit this bill, but some fish do. Uh, I was doing a lab in university biology once. I don't even remember what the purpose of the lab was. I just remember that we were dissecting a fish for something and my fish was pregnant and when I cut her open, like one million little baby fish egg things came out and it was awesome. Kind of gross, but also fairly awesome. Uh, and if you are lucky, you will get to dissect something one day and it will still have something in its stomach. Uh, did any of you, when you dissected your pig, did it have something in its stomach still? When I dissected a frog in grade nine, it still had the shell of whatever bug it had been eating in its stomach. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how I got so lucky as to get these awesome dissection things. Uh, but small animals like fish, uh, I had an aquarium when I used to teach at JP2 and people would always, I don't know why, just bring me fish for my aquarium. And I had a white fish and a black fish uh, and they liked each other apparently because they had babies like there was no tomorrow. All of a sudden I came in one day and one day there was like 20 little white and black speckled fish and I was like, oh, they fell in love, that's so sweet. And then like a week later, it seemed like there were like 50 of them and I had to get rid of some of them because my tank wasn't big enough. Uh, but especially really small fish, will fit the bill of an R strategist. Then, my fish in the fish tank, the, what I like to say is the mommy fish, the white fish, she was tired of having babies because I came in the next day and she was uh, sucked up in the filter and I thought like she ended it for herself. Like, goodbye crew world, I don't want to take care of 124 baby fish anymore. But those are some really good examples of R strategists. Uh, now, K strategists, K strategists have some characteristics. First characteristics is few, sometimes only one, descendant per cycle. So human beings are K strategists. We fit the bill for all of these things. I'll just put us here right away. But any type of organism that each time the female is laying eggs or giving birth uh, is having, like I said, not more than something that's in double digits, then we could say they are probably a K strategist. The next thing that is very typical is that one parent, at least, cares for the young. 
Now, typically, it's the female parent in a lot of animal situations. It's not always the case. Uh, if you've ever watched uh, Happy Feet, the little penguin movie, the daddy penguin has to stay with the egg while the mommy penguin goes to get food. So if one of the parents, male or female, is caring for the young or protecting the eggs or doing something to care for them, they probably fall in the K strategist category. I'm actually going to write the word eggs here because sometimes people get it in their heads that if an organism is laying an egg, that's not as difficult as giving birth to, a li to live young. Uh, and just the fact that you're laying an egg doesn't mean that you're an R strategist. The next one is that the young take time to reach sexual maturity. And I'm going to write the word years here because that is typically the scenario. It will take them at least a year, sometimes several years, before they are able to reproduce. And then the next one is about their size. Since our strategists tend to be small, K strategists tend to be large, uh, and small and large are not very descriptive words. So if I could give you some things to look for, if we are giving you a mass in kilograms or a height or a length in meters, that's big. I rarely see them give a mass or a height if it's not for a big organism. Uh, in fact, I looked through old diploma questions and I could not find one where they told me, oh, this bacteria weighs six micrograms and is 0.1 micrometers in size. Uh, so usually if they're going to give you a size or a mass, it's probably because the organism is big. Uh, the last one is longevity. And again, I'm going to put years here. If the organism cannot make it through an entire calendar year of all four seasons, I don't think we would say they have longevity. So if an organism can live for several years, possibly, we would say that it has longevity. So humans are a really good example of a K strategist. Could anyone think of something else that would probably be a K strategist? They're big, they have one baby at a time, one parent cares for the young, yes. An elephant would be an excellent example of that. Does anyone know how long, do you know this, how long, yeah? Yeah, so the female elephant is pregnant for basically two years, which, let me tell you, nine and a half months, which is really how long you're pregnant for when you're human, is a long time. And at the end of that nine and a half months, you are ready to do more or less anything to get the baby out because you are done. It is heavy, you are tired. So if I had to multiply that by two and then add some more, I'm not actually sure that I would have a human baby living at my house right now. I don't know what I would have done, but not two years, way too long. So good for those elephants. But that is a really extreme example where it fits every single thing on that list. Does anyone have any other examples they want to share? Probably any animal that you can think of that you would see on a daily basis would be a K strategist. So I'm going to put cats and dogs here. But your basic pet, cats, dogs, rabbits, most types of birds, uh, what else do people have as pets? Um, hamsters. What else do you guys have? Probably some of you have a lizard or a snake or something like that. Most of those things would probably be a K strategist because they probably fit most of those characteristics. Now, these characteristics are guidelines. Doesn't mean that you have to have all of them. No. Doesn't mean that you have to have them from only one list. No. Some organisms might mostly be a K strategist, but actually have a couple characteristics that make them an R strategist.